Hi, hi everyone. Yeah, thank you yeah, for uh, joining this uh, joint medical seminar by University of Malaysia and Changgung Memorial Hospital. So uh, we welcome uh, our guests from Changgung Memorial Hospital. So the, the main team here uh, come from Changgung Memorial Hospital in uh, Lingko, which is near to Taipei. Yeah, they have uh, for the Malaysian audience, they are the biggest hospital establishment in Taiwan with the most resources. They have seven hospitals there, and uh, Linko is their biggest hospital. Yeah, they have uh, every instrument, every equipment, and every expert that, uh, <coughs> that we know of. Uh, so that's congratulations to them. Yeah, and uh, also uh, today we are uh, graced by uh, uh, Miss Wu Lingying uh, from the Taipei Economic and Cultural uh, Office. Uh, this a uh, high-ranking officer from the government of Taiwan. So uh, without further ado, yeah, I will introduce the chief delegation from uh, Changgong Memorial Hospital, Professor Yakob Pang, uh, who is my uh, good friend. Yeah, uh, he is also a urologist and also a deputy superintendent of the hospital in uh, Changgong Memorial Hospital. Uh, Yakob, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ong, for your nice uh, introduction. Uh, actually. Our, our leader is supposed to be uh, Professor Wei. Uh, he's supposed to lead uh, this team uh, that uh, we intend to come to uh, University of Malaya and also uh, visiting some friends here. So uh, it's our privilege uh, to be here and, uh, and I'd like to express my uh, gratitude to all of you uh, for your nice hospitality. And in fact, uh, I think uh, UM and Changa Memorial Hospital has been uh, working together and we signed an MOU back in uh, 2019. Uh, so we, we have a relationship actually, a very good relationship. And, and, but unfortunately due to the uh, pandemic, uh, we, we stopped uh, uh, those kind of uh, physical activity. But we continue our communication and, and, and collaboration through webinar uh, during the past two years. I think uh, I'd like to express my, my gratitude to you all as well because uh, you are very supportive for this uh, webinar that we, we uh, organized in the past two years. And I hope uh, now there's no excuse. So we have to come down and, and, and visit you and, and hopefully in the future, uh, you can visit us in, 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 in tai Taiwan, Taipei as well. So uh, with that, uh, I, I, again, I'd like to uh, send my regards and, and thank you for hosting us and having this uh, nice small uh, seminar. But uh, we hope uh, we prepare some of our topic and this is only part of our hospital uh, specialty uh, member are here, but uh, in the future we can uh, extend more uh, topic uh, that we can discuss further and uh, so I, I will be brief and hope we all enjoy today's uh, seminar. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, and then of course we will follow the schedule. I'm sure you have the schedule here. Yeah, uh, talk by our representative from University Malaya and also from Changgong uh, Memorial Hospital. So the session, I believe, is recorded. Yeah, uh, if it's not, please do that so you can later share huh, on the social media and our you know uh, UN platform as well. Yeah. So we'll start with the uh, oncology top topic today. Yeah, we have uh, Professor Ho here. With the head of oncology here as well. So uh, the first topic here is on the current aspect on precision medicine for urological uh, cancer. Yeah, I think it's relevant to many of us here. So we have uh, Prof Bang to give the talk. Right? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you once again. Uh, I, I think uh, we have a mixed audience here. So when I prepare this uh, talk and uh, I'm wondering uh, what, sh what topic should I, should I give? And I know uh, uh, Pro Ho is here and uh, he's uh, head of the oncology. Maybe uh, later on we can get a good comment from, from you. And uh, so I, I try to um, ex uh, share with you some of my experience and the research that I'm doing uh, during the past uh, few years. Uh, so although the uh, topic is current 
uh, aspect, but I try to focus on things that I know and then and, and I involved uh, in during the past year. So uh, I, I'm a urology, but uh, uh, I focus in uh, uro oncology. And uh, in my department, we have 32 urologists. Uh, we consider one of the biggest uh, uh, urology department in the world. And so that because we are so many urology, so we want to uh, be more specific. And uh, I'm I uh, uh, very focused in uh, oncology treatment. So in this topic, I just want to begin with this uh, slide. As you know, now we are moving uh, into a new era. It's nowadays when you talk about cancer treatment, it's not uh, about how to do surgery or to do chemotherapy. And now we are talking about uh, target therapy and uh, all sort of things. And and we are no longer treat one patient and uh, and everything's. Uh, uh, it's common, but we want to look at a person's uh, uh, genetic background and his uh, environment aspect uh, to find a real solution for this individual. So, so now uh, it is uh, it is an uh, era of uh, personal medicine, so called, or physician medicine, and it's no longer uh, one treat fit all. It's a concept of. Uh, not one side fits all approach. It's a individual, individualized treatment. So, if you, in order to do so, we have to know not only the cancer aspect, but uh, as an individual, uh, whether this person, uh, the best way to treat him is is with this treatment, or what kind of uh, adverse effect if, if he he take this drug. So it's all come down to very personalized and. Uh, and, and in order to uh, reach this goal, we, we need to know uh, the genetic background, especially the genetic background of this patient. So uh, I think this uh, so-called precision medicine has drawn a lot of attention, uh, not, not only uh, the medical field, but it's the scale is, uh, is go up to uh, very high, uh, like in the, in, in the scale of uh, the garments, I uh, want to lead this kind of a project or want to push forward uh, this new concept of uh, a new idea of uh, treatment, concept of uh, treatment. So uh, I think this is a famous uh, declare by uh, President Obama. Uh, this is a, a physician medicine initiative in America that they want to target. And even with this, we want to reach this goal, they have so-called moonshot uh, project. Uh, they see this is a, a project for uh, the future. We want to uh, cure every cancer if we can, uh, if we know uh, every aspect of the cancer. So, uh, so this is a bit of background uh, introduction. So I think I will just keep this part. You can either call this uh, precision medicine or personal medicine, but uh, basically, uh, I think both terms are a bit. Uh, quite similar, but there's some small aspect, and the way you look at it is, is uh, maybe from uh, pe uh, different people may have different uh, interpre uh, interpretation, but uh, I think basically it's the uh, is uh, the same. I mean, we want to treat uh, one person uh, according to its uh, genetic background and and its uh, really personalized uh, treatments. Uh, 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 regimen. So uh, I think uh, nowadays this uh, precision medicine, uh, although it's not a, a routine or become a, 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 a everyone will, will get this benefit, but uh, according to what uh, the American data, if, if a hospital uh, apply this to the patient treatment, we can see that uh, with, with the precision medicine that we apply, uh, we, we can see it can extend the uh, treatment outcome, uh, extend the overall survival of, the, of this patient. So uh, uh, I believe that if we implement this uh, precision medicine to uh, every every patient, uh, we, we surely will see a good, uh, better result uh, of the treatment. And, and I provide some of the uh, background. 
of, of precision medicine. Then now I come down to my specialty. I, I'll, I'll discuss two cancer category. One is the prostate cancer and the other one is the uh, urothelial cancer that I, I involve quite a lot in, in, in the research. So for prostate cancer, I think uh, we can consider this is one of the most successful stories of uh, personal medicine. Why, why is that? Uh, because uh, throughout the uh, treatment history of prostate cancer, we can see uh, we, uh, there's a, a great discovery is uh, back in 1940 uh, when we know that, uh, in fact, we, we realize that uh, prostate cancer is a cancer that uh, related to uh, androgen, the hormones uh, uh, situation. So. Once you, uh, I think uh, Professor Hagging uh, is a urologist, he, he, he tried to castrate a patient and we found that uh, once you castrate the patient, uh, it improved the uh, outcome of the prostate cancer. So, and it, it's, it helped to relieve a lot of uh, prostate cancer uh, patients' uh, pain and, and, and condition. And in those days, prostate cancer is always diagnos diagnosed uh, in the late state. So many patients are suffering uh, metastatic cancer, so they, are, they have a lot of uh, 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 painful conditions and, and very bad condition. So with that, I think uh, this start, uh, when I look at that, look at this history, I, I, I think that prostate cancer, we can consider this is a, 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 another type of uh, uh, target therapy or position uh, treatment because uh, at those days we don't know the mechanism behind it, but we know that hormone can really uh, uh, treat the patients and when we do the culture, take away the hormone. So it, is, it has to do with some uh, hormone regulation. And so slowly we know that uh, uh, the mechanism behind it and uh, it is, uh, first again, it's a hormone sensitive uh, cancer and slowly we, we, we don't castrate, we don't do surgical castration for patients and we develop this uh, LHRH analog uh, that which can, um, that we can block the uh, synthesis of uh, androgen. So, and slowly uh, we come uh, to a new era that we develop a new drug that can block the androgen receptor function and, and now uh, there are more drugs to play, play a role in, in the treatment of uh, prostate cancer. So this is the uh, history or lands, landscape of uh, prostate cancer treatment development. And throughout this development, I think history, we can see how, how we change the uh, aspect of uh, cancer treatment uh, from, uh, medis uh, from a simple medi medication, but now it's, it's rather complicated. So many, many drugs can be used, but uh, how, how are we going to benefit patients with this drug? And we have to be, uh, be more precise and, and we, we need to know uh, the genetic background of the cancer uh, in order to, to get a better treatment outcome. So uh, just to give you a bit of uh, cancer background, I think uh, now prostate cancer is the leading uh, cancer in the US and worldwide it's also a very uh, high, had a high incident and, and it's about two, uh, it's the second most frequent cancer. And in Taiwan, we, every year we have 7,000 uh, new diagnosis cases. I think this figure is uh, it's a bit less than, uh, it's a bit more than the one you, you see in Malaysia. But I can uh, check your uh, cancer registry, I think the case number is increasing as well throughout this year. Uh, probably due to the aging population and maybe you have some kind of uh, uh, cancer awareness program going on and you do uh, PSA screening as well. So, but the problem is not a uh, case number. Uh, so uh, in Taiwan, uh, prostate cancer ranking uh, number, f uh, number five, the fifth uh, most common cancer uh, among men. and. Uh, uh, mortality, in terms of mortality, is uh, uh, ranking uh, seventh uh, in terms of the mortality rate uh, in men. And, but I think what I want to sh point out this, uh, this is the most important slide uh, among the 
can uh, first cancer incident is uh, you can see in Taiwan we uh, have uh, less localized disease but we have higher um, advanced cases like uh, even uh, we have seven percent of patients uh, is uh, considered uh, uh, distant uh, metastatic is considered about thirty two percent but for the U.S. one, it's, uh, it's, it's, about, it's less, so 21 percent. So, and uh, why it's important? Because uh, if you diagnose uh, early, uh, you will have a uh, better survival, but for already, uh, distant uh, cancer, like ma advanced cancer, uh, the mortality rate can, uh, the survival rate can come down to 32 percent. So uh, this is a, a cartoon uh, uh, draw, uh, to show you why uh, prostate cancer uh, treatment is considered uh, one of the uh, good example for precision medicine and, and so-called uh, target therapy uh, in, in terms of uh, hormone therapy. So because uh, we know uh, hormone, uh, these uh, androgens, uh, will bind to the androgen receptor, so that's how it triggered the uh, uh, gene expansion, and it, it uh, uh, is uh, control the growth of the uh, prostate cancer cell. And if we can block this uh, axis, either by blocking the androgen receptor or cut down the hormone, or take away the hormone, then uh, we can stop the proliferation or, or try to keep this uh, prostate cancer in the in 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 a stable stage, and and tr throughout this year, I think uh, we have developed many many new drugs, and this is a, 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 a timeline for for one uh, prostate cancer patient. Uh, either if you treat them well in the beginning, and uh, they can uh, get cured, but once once the patient uh, develop a, a metastatic. Uh, condition uh, usually this cancer uh, is hard to cure after they, they become uh, metastatic so uh, throughout the treatment time uh, uh, this PSA or this condition can can up go up and down uh, and uh, you need to give a different drug in uh, in different stage so I think uh, since uh, we have a mixed audience here I, I won't go into detail here but uh, you can see a lot of uh, treatments uh, can be used uh, throughout the uh, treatment courses, and and uh, I will bring you, uh, I will show you some of my uh, study in the past. Uh, so I I start to uh, involve in prostate cancer uh, research when I was in Sweden, and I, uh, this is my PhD uh, thesis. Uh, I focus in uh, in the study of. Uh, uh, prostate cancer by I want to know by by studying the gene expression of uh, uh, androgen receptor so uh, I published a, a few paper regarding uh, prostate cancer growth and, and this and try to find out the mechanism behind it and and uh, this is how I, I become uh, interested uh, in, in prostate cancer treatment and, and nowadays, I think uh, for this cancer treatment, we come to a new a, a new era. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, antigens uh, that I want to uh, uh, let you know, which is very important. Uh, it's called uh, prostate-specific antigens. And this is a survey antigen that you can find in the prostate cancer cell, cell membrane. And with this uh, discovery, now we can uh, we can use this receptor as a antigen uh, as a marker biomarker to uh, to de somehow detect the prostate cancer and also using this uh, antigen this biomarker as a therapeutic uh, target as well so uh, in the past few years we we involved quite a lot of study uh, to find out uh, if this uh, PSA may uh, can be used as a diagnostic and and can be used as a treatment target. So this is one of our paper that we published and we use this uh, nanoparticle to, to sort of uh, uh, increase the uh, detection of the cancer cell in the bloodstream. So 
we want to, uh, to uh, use it as a biosensor uh, to help us to detect uh, prostate cancer in the early stage. So uh, we published in a quite a nice journal, the advanced material, uh, back in uh, uh, it is uh, 2014 uh, uh, at that time. Then uh, we slowly know that uh, nowadays we can use uh, PSMA uh, for, for PET, PET imaging. And, and in this study, we, we want to uh, show that uh, actually we can use, uh, uh, if we want to be more specific, we can uh, label two kind of uh, marker to detect the prostate cancer cell in the bloodstream. So, and and now, uh, since we have this uh, PET CT that we can detect prostate cancer by uh, by using PSMA uh, gallium uh, 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 tracer, so now we in our hospital we have already applied this uh, for for the patient uh, uh, screening and detection, and and recently we published uh, two paper. Uh, uh, to show our our, uh, our our sensitivity and and and, and it is a, although it's a pilot study, but we also want to show that this uh, marker can be used as an indicator for uh, androgen uh, therapeutic uh, deprivation therapy uh, 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 monitoring uh, marker as well. So. So now uh, we move to another stage. We are using this uh, uh, marker to treat patients uh, by uh, labeling this uh, marker with uh, another uh, uh, isotope, uh, which is uh, lutetium-177. I, I bet uh, in Malaysia you already, probably you have, uh, have this treatment as well. So in my hospital, we recently uh, started this uh, treatment uh, regimen and, and we see a very promising data and hopefully in the future we can share the data with you. So uh, not only that, I mean uh, prostate cancer treatments uh, not in, only involve in uh, uh, cancer care, but we also have to look at the uh, adverse effect of this uh, hormone therapy. So with the help of our cardiologists, uh, we look at our database and and we, we found out, somehow we found out that uh, there is a, a, rela uh, a relationship between uh, cardiovascular uh, ischemic event with uh, uh, endogen deprivation therapy. And in this uh, important paper, uh, which we published in the uh, Journal of Clinical Oncology, we showed that uh, du during the first uh, 1.5 year of uh, ADT treatment, uh, you have a higher uh, risk of uh, 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 develop this uh, uh, CV ischemic event in, in patients who receive uh, okay, uh, surgical castration. So, so when we do surgical castration, we have to really be careful of that. Uh, and patients need to be advised that they may develop a serious uh, uh, cardiovascular event. And uh, of course, uh, now we have more drug, as I mentioned. So, and all these drug treatment uh, have to come down with, uh, have to match with the uh, gene mutation of the cancer. So, uh, when you want to give this drug, you have to do uh, a genetic testing, and so that uh, you you will find the right drug for the right patients. Such as, uh, I think one of the famous uh, drug now we are using for breast cancer is the BRCA1 gene mutation, uh, or our permit. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, HR of uh, uh, chromatin the uh, uh, moderating uh, blocking agent uh, for for prostate cancer treatment. Although this uh, BRCA gene mutation are uh, famous in uh, breast cancer, but we do find that uh, about twenty percent of this prostate cancer had had uh, BRCA gene mutation. And uh, so I will move on to the next to topic that uh, I think is more interested, especially uh, when it come to Asia. Uh, if uh, uh, I want to show you some of our latest result uh, study, uh, 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 some of you may not 
uh, understand what is uh, urothelial cancer. Actually, urothelial cancer can be uh, can can happens in in the upper tract and the lower tract. So uh, in Taiwan and in Asia, we found that actually uh, for this uh, urothelial cancer, uh, we have a higher in incident of this cancer in Taiwan, and uh, then. Uh, we slowly found out that actually uh, this cancer is related to one of the carcinogen that uh, we consume when we take some of the uh, Chinese herb medicines and and there are many many data right now to support this kind of uh, uh, finding and uh, I wouldn't go into detail but eventually uh, we found that uh, in this uh, special herb medicine, uh, there is one particular uh, carcinogen called aridotic acid, uh, which can cause uh, nephropathy. Uh, and then, uh, if you consume a very high dose in a shorter period of time, uh, you may go into heart failure, uh, real uh, kidney failure, and you need uh, hemodialysis. And but if you consume uh, small amount and in the long, uh, long time, uh, you may develop a cancer. You have a higher risk of developing cancer. So uh, we found that 50% uh, of our uh, uh, UQC means uh, upper tract urethral cancer has some kind of uh, AA associate uh, uh, DNA adapt. This why why we call this DNA adapt means uh, uh, we can detect the the carcinogen uh, 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 genetic uh, changes in, in our DNA. So this is a kind of uh, genetic uh, fingerprinting uh, that we can fingerprint that we can uh, we can confirm that these patients are uh, in, uh, has expo exposed uh, of uh, AA toxications. So uh, we publish a paper in uh, in Science Translation Medicine. Uh, few few years back, and and we found that there's a special mutation signature uh, that is uh, related to uh, AA uh, AA consume consume com, uh, consumption. So when we study the uh, DNA uh, of this patient cancer, if we found this, if, if we found more of these uh, A to T and T to A mutations, uh, then we can say that probably he he or she uh, has. Uh, contact this uh, AA uh, uh, carcinogens uh, in the past year. So this is a, a new discovery and it can sort of uh, serve as a biomarker to, to tell the patient uh, what, what kind of uh, uh, cause that you have uh, to get uh, this uh, cancer. And uh, b because this is a very uh, important issue so we, 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 we have a press conference and to let people know that uh, you have to avoid uh, those uh, herbs uh, w which contain uh, uh, aridosic acid. Uh, so now uh, the government in Taiwan has already banned this kind of uh, 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 herb medicine. But still, uh, I think in, the, in, in South Asia or in the China, uh, many, many patients or many people will still uh, be able to uh, uh, contact or consume this kind of uh, herb medicine. So uh, we we have uh, we, we still need a lot of uh, public educations uh, to to uh, even the doctor have to know that uh, we we somehow have to avoid this kind of uh, uh, herbal medicines. And uh, we also found not in the kidney cancer but in the liver cancer, we also found the signature of this uh, AA mutation. Uh, in, in, in Taiwan, we, we do uh, 90, uh, about 78% of the, 80% uh, of the uh, HCC sample that we, 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 we try to uh, do the, the uh, whole genome sequencing, we found that uh, this AA mutation signature is, has been there. So it, it, it's, uh, it shows that uh, uh, maybe, maybe the liver cancer uh, also uh, one of the cause of the uh, uh, AA, AA mutation, or AA carcinogen, but but we don't know uh, whether it's the direct cause 
or it's an uh, indirect cost. And with this uh, study, uh, it's a joint study with uh, Singapore National Cancer Center, so uh, together with a few team of uh, Asia uh, scientists, uh, we received this uh, very high prestigious uh, award in, in 2018, the AACR Team Science Award. So, and of course, uh, we are continuing with our study and we want to know uh, why why AA can cause uh, cancer and why what is the real mechanism? So this is one of our study that we found that one of these uh, KDM six A genes uh, has played a role in, in the in the uh, carcinogenic genic, uh, uh, process. And so with that, uh, I think uh, I just show you a few example of uh, why it is important to go. Uh, beyond our surgery and uh, current medicine, we have to dig uh, 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 deeper to find out the genetic background of the cancer so that we can understand uh, better of this cancer mechanism and find the solution for, for, for the cancer treatment. So uh, I think I will skip this part because of the time constraint. So in the future, I think, uh, can, uh, not future, maybe currently we are trying to adapt this new new concept of personal medicine. And uh, whenever we treat a patient, we want to take out the patient's uh, cancer tissue and we can do uh, uh, tissue culture and before uh, and continue with the uh, genetic study and we want to find out the genetic background of the cancer. And even then we can uh, uh, we, uh, apply to 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 the animal model and to find the best way to, to treat the cancer. So uh, this is uh, my uh, continuous study and then we, we want to really come down to, to the um, a basic uh, uh, study to find out the exactly uh, mechanism behind uh, your tibia cancer development. So, so this is one of the other genes that we want to study. Okay. Uh, Okay, with that, I think I will stop here because of time frame. And, and I, I, I just want to show this last time. I think this is a, a lot of hard work, but uh, now I, I feel that uh, I've contributed a little bit of uh, science and, and advanced the treatment of the cancer. So I'm, I'm very happy, happy with that. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Professor Pang. So, uh, there's a very important thing you want to slide you remember is the Aristo uh, uh, cholic acid, and that is important uh, component that cause upper tract urothelial carcinoma. You know. So, that is the important uh, discovery. And you mark that now, maybe we ask that in the exam, you know, for the student. Okay, <laughs> so, yeah, that's uh, thanks, Professor Pang. Uh, next one, we hear from uh, our uh, urologist, uh, uh, Dr. Yo Wei Xian, uh, on precision uh, medicine on the biopsy. Uh, biopsy or prostate? Uh, I think the, the, the landscape is changing really. Uh, the old traditional way might not apply. Uh, you know, so new thing coming in. So we have our uh, next generation of uh, uh, urologists uh, to help and advise us on that. Uh, Dr. Yo, please. Yeah. Thank you for, long for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you everyone for having me today. I'd like to welcome our guests from uh, Changkong Memorial. Welcome to Malaysia. And uh, please bear with me while I just quickly run through some of the things that we've been doing with our precision point biopsy. Right, so I've known uh, disclaimers to declare. So prostate cancer is actually the second most commonly diagnosed cancer among men in Malaysia after lung cancer. And the incidence is actually increasing steadily over the years. And we have an age standardized incidence of about 29.4 per 100,000 population. And the diagnosis is typically achieved via transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, or known as truss biopsy. And it is still the preferred method in Malaysia. Right? And the reasons for that is uh, probably due to setup. Uh, it's usually done under local anesthesia and daycare. The cost of it is uh, a bit more affordable as well as the familiarity of our performance, the doctors doing the biopsy, because we were all trained doing transrectal biopsy. However, the shortcoming is that 
Sometimes, despite a negative uh, transrectal biopsy, patients still have elevated PSA and they eventually they may turn up cancer later on in life. So, uh, a few years ago, just to quote a paper, we have a local study in our center uh, looking at patients with a PSA of 4 to 10, right? And uh, we found that actually with trust biopsy, transrectal biopsy, we only managed to diagnose 14.3% of patients. So out of 100 patients who went for trust biopsy, 14.3 was positive for cancer. The question is, was it good enough? Because some of them continued to have elevating PSA and we were not able to find anything more after that. So uh, this was just recently came out in the Medscape and uh, the, the paper was actually uh, discussed at the EAU in Milan, just concluded last month, where a uh, practice change in Norway because someone actually died from a transrectal biopsy due to sepsis and Norway has started to adopt transperineal biopsies. Right. And uh, we know that there was a uh, movement in Australia and back in 2020 among these people, one of the people whom I had the honour of working with was Jeremy Grummer, the first author, was proposing that transrectal biopsy should be uh, on the way out and they have transi transitioned to doing transperineal biopsy. Uh, but there are some issues related to biopsy, especially in Southeast Asia, where we, uh, our population is not as affluent, our access to resources is also limited. Right? So one is the uh, issue of uh, biopsy, pre-biopsy imaging, uh, whether you want to do an MRI first, or as Prof. Wang puts it, PSMA PET, or no imaging. Right? The approach is also something to discuss. Uh, traditionally transrectal, still the preferred method in Malaysia, but slowly transitioning to transperineal, I hope. Uh, the strategy for biopsy as well, whether you want to do machine image fusion, cognitive fusion versus in ball MRI biopsy, and also just whether to take the targeted biopsy or you take a targeted and systematic biopsy at the same time. Certainly there are issues related to adverse events between the two modalities, as well as the possibility of detecting significant prostate cancer. But certainly, uh, irregardless of what resources we say, the EAU guidelines have recently changed and they've recommended that transperineal biopsies are the preferred method of uh, biopsy. It comes with a strong recommendation. So in our centre, UMMC, we started to offer uh, transperineal biopsy to those with previous negative trust biopsies, but we persistently raised PSA. But we also offered upfront transperineal biopsies to patients who choose to have it. Uh, especially if they have pre-biopsy imaging, for example, and a multi-parametric MRI. Stop <laughs> so we started offering uh, transperineal biopsy back in 2020, and initially it was done in the OT setting using a stepper and a grid under general anesthesia. That's the stepper and the grid. And uh, because we did not have it at that point in time, uh, so we had to loan it, right? But this, however, inundated our OT list, and then COVID-19 struck, and we had no access to uh, OT. So we transitioned to doing transperineal biopsy under general anesthesia, but uh, using a freehand technique without the grid, using this, a device called the precision point. And we did this in the daycare OT setting. Notice that it's still OT, patient is still in stirrups. But after a while, we got a bit confident, and then we started to move towards uh, local anesthesia. And now we do it in a daycare on the UDS couch under local anesthesia, but using a similar precision point uh, coaxial needle device to achieve more accurate uh, targeted biopsies. Right. So uh, uh, now we're doing all this, and uh, maybe just a quick video. So I usually uh, administer local anesthetic on the skin first, right, and it's quite well tolerated by patients as long as you tell them what to expect. And then after that, uh, I will start to scan the prostate to have a look at the size of the prostate as well as to plan the biopsy strategy uh, because before that, it will involve uh, studying the MRI to look, uh, identify the areas of abnormality. But certainly after that, uh, when we do the MRI, uh, because I do it under cognitive fusion, so uh, we identify the areas that we want to target as well as the areas where we will take systematic biopsies. Right? And after I've done that, I will, uh, after I've done that, then I will administer the periprosthetic, the local anesthetic block. This is one of the most uh, important part, as well as also slightly more uncomfortable part for the patients. Most of the patients will not like this part too much. 
you sting a bit, but once the anesthetic takes place, then the biopsy happens uh, without any problems. So I usually inject around the periprosthetic apical region, sometimes covering a bit deeper at the vast area. So uh, it's administered separately, one on the left and one on the right. Right, and then after that, uh, we just attach the coaxial needle. The reason, the difference between using this coaxial needle and using the grid was that uh, if one, if we use the grid, it involved multiple entry points on the skin, uh, sometimes up to 40 points on the skin. Whereas with this coaxial needle, it's just one point, and you can reach most aspects of the prostate. Right. So the device actually holds the coaxial needle in place, but also allows angulation to reach different parts of the prostate. A bit. Right, so that's how the coaxial needle is uh, applied. And once that's done, it will hold the needle in place. And then we perform the targeted biopsies. So targeted biopsy is done under direct vision, two views, axial and uh, longitudinal. And uh, we maneuver the coaxial needle to the area of target, and you will see the needle penetrating the target. So we know we've gotten the targets. So look here, you can see the needle going through. Yep, you can see the biopsy. All right. So at the end of the procedure, uh, what the patients are left with is usually just two puncture wounds on the perineum, uh, just a light dressing, and go home, shower, and they return to their normal activities. So uh, to date, data I just uh, reviewed my data uh, last over the weekend. I've done about 130. And the overall cancer detection rate is about 48.3, so it's a big difference compared to 14.8%, which we were doing for transrectal biopsy. And if you correlate it with the PIRAT score, uh, as you can tell, the, the higher the PIRAT score, which is the MRI scoring, the higher the probability of detecting cancer. So up to 56% in uh, the presence of PIRAT 5, and uh, up to 46% of them would be significant cancer, which is uh, gleason 3 plus 4 and above. But we also encounter complications, right? So hematuria can occur in up to 30% of patients. Uh, we've had about 6% of patients who present with retention. But uh, compared to transrectal biopsy, we've not encountered any life-threatening sepsis or infections. 0% rectal bleeding because there's no rectal breach. So uh, we actually managed to interview some of our patients back, called back to, uh, this is an ongoing thing, but 42 patients and actually 30 out of them actually said that they would uh, consider local to be acceptable, whereas 12 actually preferred GA. So I think different patients have different anxiety levels and we have to gauge. Um, I wouldn't say that local anesthetic is suitable for everyone. But uh, when we sub-analyzed for repeat biopsy detection, a total of 59 patients were offered transperineal after previous negative trust. That means they are not uh, biopsy naive. And a new cancer was also detected in about 45% of these patients, which means that actually we are missing a fair bit of patients if you pursue transrectal alone. Right, so, and out of, out of that, 32% are actually clinically significant cancer, which will move on to uh, radical treatment later on. So, uh, as Prof Pang said, although uh, in Taiwan they have a fair bit of uh, advanced cancers, we have about 60% of advanced cancers in Malaysia, right? And I hope that, I mean, with the advent of TP biopsies and more people uptaking it, hopefully we can diagnose cancers a bit earlier and offer patients treatment before they reach the metastatic stage. So, in summary, I think there are a lot of things trending towards transplanted biopsy. Uh, there's, a, of course, detection of more cancer, as well as more clinically significant cancer is there. Uh, my finding is not different from what the literature suggests. Uh, there's also a reduction of infective complications and sepsis. The challenges, however, is mainly to overcome the cost, as well as the access to pre-biopsy MRI and the learning curve of the uh, operator. So I think that's something that we are working towards. Right, thank you very much for your attention. Right, Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Yeo. Uh, so now the trend towards is transperineal biopsy instead of the transrector. 
how about in Chang'e Memorial? Is it all done now with transparent? Now we are. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to the uh, UM team. I think uh, you have uh, totally converted now, right, to Transparinium. But at the moment, in Chang'un, we still perform both of them. Yeah, it really depends on uh, whether the patient had the MI. So in, in your case, all of them had the pre, pre biopsy MI? Only two didn't have pre biopsy oh, okay. MI. Those two were like clinically obvious cancer, that's why it's 100%. So I, I think we like like you you say we have a, 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 how they get not a difficulty to overcome is to how how to get all patients to get their MRI done before biopsy. So we are still working on that and because cost and and, and we, we, as you say we, we are under one of the uh, one one health uh, care policy. So we have to negotiate with the. Uh, you know, our, our, our healthcare system. So, so not not everyone to will do that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And any question? Yeah, you can raise that. Huh? If you got any question, we can you know get the speaker to answer as well. Yeah. But everything uh cost money. Yeah. Of course, we would love to have MRI for everybody. Yeah. But MRI cost how much here in our setting? But, uh, thousand three, yeah, subsidized, subsidized, partially subsidized. Thousand three is about you know uh three hundred US dollar, yeah. It's a subsidized rate MRI is three hundred US dollar. Non subsidized will double the cost. I think six hundred uh US uh, dollar, is more than two thousand uh, ringgit uh, for us. So it can be cost plus the biopsy. It costs money as well. So Doctor Yeo offer one of the cheapest because the basic setup. There are biopsy that can cost patient up to 20,000 ringgit just for a biopsy yeah. outside you can you know you can special machine guided one huh? can be they charge up to 20,000 ringgit which is 5,000 uh, US dollar so, so don't, everything costs money so you must find ways to reduce the healthcare cost as well yeah 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 so another th thing is uh, wait, waiting time yeah mm. because they, they can't be any faster you can't speed up the machine and like pay more money machine go faster they can't do that right so one MRI scan for the prostate takes okay you guess how long I, you know the answer you know the answer right yeah you, you know one patient coming okay now you start the machine start bang okay start prostate MRI how long it takes Okay, you have the answer in your mind and I give you the answer about 45 minutes you know 40 to 45 minutes you know just for one patient for the MRI you know even you got money or whatever you can't make it to four minutes you, you, you can't do it at the moment so that's the limitation of technology as well so the waiting time for MRI is actually very long yeah uh, all right so I think uh, yeah we, we, we are good for time so we let uh, Prop Prang introduce the next speaker Prop Prang. Uh, I think we are move on. Uh, the next speaker also uh, from Taiwan. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Doctor Yap. Uh, Doctor Yap is a, a radio oncologist. Uh, he got his uh, medical degree in, in National of Taiwan University, and then uh, he joined Chang'an uh, Memorial Hospital. Uh, get his full training there. So uh, I think he he want to share our proton therapy experience. We we have the probably there for seven years already so and uh, we are the number one uh, first hospital in South Asia to have proton therapy yeah thank you Malaysia at the moment, uh, for, for hope we don't have proton therapy yet. It's the, it's the top everybody want proton, proton. Now we see how powerful that is. Thank you for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yap Wing Kim. I'm a radiation oncologist at, at Lincoln Shankar Proton Center. Okay. I'm truly honored today to have this opportunity to share with you the topic, Advanced 
advancing cancer treatment with proton therapy in liver cancer and head and neck cancer. So this is the outline for today's presentation. Okay, I will give a brief introduction of uh, the unique characteristics of proton beam therapy, and then I will delve into the specific uh, sites of cancers, uh, about the role that proton plays and uh, the advantages of using proton beam therapy. Okay, so, uh, okay, cancer is uh, um, fundamentally a genetic disease, so genetic mutations uh, can cause uh, normal cell to be uh, become cancerous, and cancerous cells then grow uncontrollably and then invade the uh, surrounding tissues, organs, and uh, at the end uh, metastasize to distant organs, uh, leading to the patient death. So, um, uh, and this can uh, happen in any organs or tissues uh, from our body in our body. So, uh, cancer patients can be broadly categorized into two. Problem solved. I will continue. So, um, cancer patient can be broadly <coughs> categorized into two main subgroups: local disease and the systemic disease. For local disease, we refer to the uh, cancer that has not been spread to the distant organs or lymph nodes that is beyond a specific region. For these uh, types of patients, the chance of cure is relatively higher if you can uh, eliminate all the cancer cells using the local therapy, including surgery, radiotherapy, plus minus chemotherapy, and uh, or a combination of above. And uh, for the systemic disease, when the disease has been spread uh, systemically, the main, uh, uh, the main treatment will be the systemic therapy and the chance of cure is uh, low and uh, we primarily focus on the QOL, maintaining of the QOL of the patient quality of life. So for today's talk, I will focus on the localized disease and uh, specifically on radiotherapy. So um, external beam radiotherapy for short is EBRT. It's the most commonly used form of radiotherapy. Uh, this uh, type of treatment, it use um, a <coughs> machine outside the body to aim the radiation to the cancer and then try to avoid the healthy tissue surrounding cancer in order to uh, avoid side effects from uh, radiation exposure. So there are all kinds of ionizing radiation that we can use and uh, to do radiotherapy and for the for the external beam radiotherapy, the most commonly used radiation is the X-ray. So you, you, you heard a lot of terms, uh, SPRT, IMRT, VMAT, anything uh, doesn't have a proton in it, it's not proton therapy. It's just plain X-ray radiotherapy. You can, all can, you can have all kinds of fancy names, but uh, it's not proton therapy. So X-ray is, uh, is uh, one of the it's one of the electromagnetic waves, also known as uh, photon beams. Photon means light, right? something like light. Uh, but uh, proton beams belongs to the particle beams. So uh, that's the fundamental difference. So they are different from their physical properties and how they deposit the, both, uh, the dose 
along the path. So this is the cartoon showing the difference between uh, proton and X-ray and how they depose the dose, deposit the dose. So when X-ray enters the body, the beam passes through and out the body and along the whole path it deposits the dose. Uh, so uh, including the surrounding uh, uh, healthy tissue. Um, but for proton therapy, when the beams uh, enter the body, we can precisely control where the proton beam release most of its energy at a certain depth, precisely by controlling the, 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 the beam energy. So, so only the entrance part will have some uh, low and intermediate dose, and there is essentially no dose, uh, no exit dose behind the tumor. So you can spare the normal tissue behind the tumor perfectly. So, but to, to be fair, uh, X-ray radiotherapy uh, has been advancing over the years. Now we have a lot of fancy techniques. We don't usually use one bean of X-ray to treat the patient. We use many beans, multiple beans, and also uh, beans with um, intensity modulation to sculpt the dose that we want. Uh, this advanced technique is usually called the IMRT, Intensity Modulated Radiotherapy. But even with IMRT, you will have this low and intermediate dose spreading uh, surrounding the tissue, spreading out. But uh, in contrast for proton beam therapy, we usually just use two to three, three beans arrangement, we design the arrangement so that we can spare the very critical organ uh, 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 adjacent to the tumor. And this is uh, the very unique, um, very unique uh, characteristic of proton beam therapy. And the, the biggest difference is here. So uh, because of this um, dosimetric difference, we can have uh, three potential benefits, if not more, okay, for using proton beam therapy. The first one I would say is to increase the con tumor control and the chance of cure. And how do we achieve this? It is by, uh, we can increase the dose to the tumor, uh, at the same time spare the critical organ at risk. So giving higher dose than uh, we normally give using X-ray radiotherapy. Because if you want to use the IMRT to do this, you increase the dose to the tumor, you also proportionally increase the dose of the intermediate and low dose area. And this intermediate dose sometimes can damage the organ at risk, such as uh, spinal cord, brain stem, or even uh, low dose can uh, damage your liver. So it is uh, quite critical in treating liver cancer and chordoma. And second benefit is that we can reduce the acute and late toxicity uh, by reducing the dose to the surrounding sensitive organ and normal tissue. And this is more important in treating head and neck cancer because there are so many sensitive organs and tissue around that area. And the third is to reduce the risk of RT, radiation-induced malignancy. Because by using proton beam therapy, the integral dose is reduced. So, but uh, the RT induced malignancy takes around seven to 10 years to develop. So it is more of an issue to the pediatric patients, not so for the older people. Uh, run off of battery, more battery. Mm -hmm. So uh, in a nutshell, proton therapy is just an advanced and highly precise form of EBRT, it takes the similar cost of normal RT. Uh, for, for a typical cost, you, you do it five days per week and you take several weeks to complete the cost, just like a normal RT. So it's just the advanced form of EBRT. This, this, is, our, this, uh, this is our establishment, uh, operating since 2015, November. This cartoon shows the system of our radio uh, proton therapy. And the picture below here is the actual delivery system 
inside one of our treatment room. Um, all of our four treatment rooms are equipped with a 360 degree rotational gantry, so we can aim the beam at any angle. And all of the room equipped with a 60 robotic couch to place the patient. And with onboard imaging, we can do localization before each treatment. Excellent. Next please. And one of the room equipped with an older technique called the passive scattering beam (PSPT). It is a uh, it, it treats the, the whole volume at the same instance. So it is uh, better for those moving targets with simple geometry because it does not have this uh, interplay uh, action. When the beam is moving and the, the organ is moving, there will be some interplay effect. Uh, and the other three room, we have the state-of-the-art pencil beam scanning technique, which uh, it scan the tumor layer by layer, line by line, so we can create any any uh, dose, any, any any shapes we want. So it's very conformal. The conformal, uh, conformity is better uh, compared to the PSPT. Next, next please. So if we compare the actual dose, dosimetry comparison with uh, three different techniques, one is the IMRT, one is P PSPT and I'm MPT. MPT means the pencil beam scanning technique. So uh, you can see if you use uh, either one of the proton te therapy technique, you can reduce a lot of dose spreading to the liver, to the, to, the, to the heart, to the lungs. If you compare the IMPT with the older passive scattering proton beam technique, you can see the red area the high dose area is more conformal if you use the pencil beam scanning IMPT technique. This is uh, the most uh, advanced technique we are employing more and more now in, in various sites of cancer. So, <laughs> to 2002, uh, July onwards, we have uh, treated 3,802 uh, cases and I, I think now it's more than uh, 4,000 cases already. So uh, you, as you can see, the top two uh, disease sites we treated uh, with proton is the liver and followed by head and neck cancers. And so uh, the, the following slides will be focused on these two disease. Next please. So uh, this is, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, proton therapy in liver cancer. So liver cancer patient is uh, actually very complicated because most of them uh, came in with a core existing uh, liver disease uh, such as chronic viral hepatitis, uh, alcoholic di di uh, liver disease, or the worst case they came in with liver cirrhosis, uh, which is uh, very complicated and very challenging for, for us to treat, especially for the radiotherapy side. because. Uh, Hepatocytes, liver cells can be quite sensitive to radiation. So excessive radiation dose to the liver can cause uh, liver failure. And so the liver, liver dose is often the limiting, dose limiting. It's often the dose limiting organ for, to, to our treatment. Next please. Okay. So, are we? <laughs> okay, so you can look at this, uh, the dosimetric advantage of proton therapy against uh, uh, X-ray, IMRT here. You see, we can use the proton therapy to reduce the radiation dose to normal tissue, such as the stomach, the so small bowel, and especially the liver dose, which is o o o often the dose limiting uh, organ, to ha how much dose we can give to the tumor. but. By using proton therapy, we can actually spare a part of the normal liver with essentially no dose to it. And if this part of liver that's spared is uh, big, in, uh, big enough in volume, like 300, 400 cc, we can go on treat with uh, as high dose as you want to give to the tumor. So uh, we can treat tumor as large as uh, more than 10 centimeters, more than five centimeters, this big tumor that we cannot treat with SBRT, which is the um, 
I mean uh, the, the the X-ray treatment. Uh, but even if for the small tumor, you can treat with SPRT, right? But uh, this patient usually that tend to recur in the liver, we call it intrahepatic liver. So this is not the only time you will treat them. You will treat them like multiple times. There, more often than not, you would have to do a retreatment. So for small lesion also, we, we tend to use proton to treat to save the residual liver for the next treatment. Next, please. So this is the cartoon showing you the precision of our proton beam therapy. Uh, we, uh, you can see it's uh, as precise as the surgery. This is the treatment plan, high dose area, and this is the MRI pre movies enhanced MRI three months post proton beam therapy. You can see this uh, high dose area is uh, exactly match the dark area here, which is uh, signal the dead liver cell. And the other part of the liver is nicely enhanced, which is alive that can take up the pre movies. Uh, next, please. So where does proton therapy fits into the treatment algorithm of HCC? Uh, so if you look at the ESMO guideline, you cannot see uh, any wording about uh, proton beam therapy. But like just I, I have shown you, proton beam therapy is just a more advanced technique of radiation therapy. So we think that you can just fit proton therapy in this category, same as the other RT techniques. And also we can do add-on therapy to taste, to, to systemic therapy, to, to, to make, uh, better uh, control the local tumor. So you know that HCG patient is actually have a very different clinical condition, even they are in the same BCLC stage because of the tumor location, tumor burden, performance status, liver function, etc. So we do need a multidisciplinary team discussion before treatment for each patient. We do that in our hospital. So uh, in summary, in a nutshell, those who are unresectable, not suitable to do IFA, not suitable to do taste, or they fail these treatments, those are the patients usually good candidates for proton therapy we treat. And, uh, but uh, we also need the patient to have a disease that's confined in liver and can safely treated radically with proton therapy alone or combination with other therapy. We usually do add-on treatment. Like the proton man invasion uh, patient, we do add-on to systemic therapy. Uh, and these are the exclusion criteria. So we have two protocols uh, from the adapted from the University of Tsukuba. Uh, for the tumors that are further away, two centimeters away from the both GI and portal abatis, we do 66 gray in 10 fraction. And for those tumors near to the uh, GI tract and portal abatis, we do 72 gray in 22 fraction. So we look at our, we retrospectively analyze our outcome uh, from 2015 uh, uh, November to 2018 December, we have uh, treated 308 patients. Uh, 221 is curative and then we take 201 patients included in our study because we excluded 8 patients that treated with non-standard protocols and we excluded 12 patients that uh, have missing data because they are interna international patients they want to follow at their local country. So look at the, if you look at the patient characteristics shown here, the me median age is around 67 years old and the uh, performance uh, is good 0 to 1 and uh, good liver function child pup A mostly and most of them have uh, underlying uh, liver disease and hepatitis B if the if it is the majority and uh, almost 60 percent of them are recurrent cases which are treated previously with uh, multiple types of modality. The median size of the tumor is around five centimeter and some of the tumor uh, is, uh, the median is six centimeter. We have uh, 
uh, around a quarter of patients having tumor larger than 10 centimeter and 40 percent of the population is multinodular and uh, 40 percent of them has this protoven tumor thrombosis which means this group of patients is actually in a very poor condition but uh, if we look at the result our median survival is uh, around more, uh, around a little bit more than two years which is uh, quite good very good in, in, uh, indeed in this uh, poor prognostic patient and um, the infield control is excellent is around 90 to 95 percent uh, 90 percent at three years uh, we try to benchmark our our results to the uh, other uh, published data uh, uh, from the Japan and US those are experience centers we, we see our result is comparable to to the published data and um, uh, what what worth mentioning is that our patient group actually have a more uh, large tumors and uh, more patients have this protoven tumor thrombosis which means our group uh, is more uh, of these are uh, bad prognostic uh, factors but if you look at the intrahepatic control which they show here PFS uh, at two years is only around 35 percent this means that this patient tends to recur in other parts of liver so you have to retreat them so that's why I say if the even if the tumor is small enough to treat with SBRT it's better to treat with proton because you have to retreat, retreat them in the future so toxicity wise it is very manageable and uh, low those who have grade 3 plus and above uh, toxicity is all lesser than 7% so in summary proton therapy offer excellent infield tumor control and the uh, treatment toxicity are acceptable and proton ther therapy benefits the, the most in patients with proton vein thrombosis and large tumor or tumors that are not suitable for other local treatments. So we publish our data, a, a, a propensity score match analysis. We compare proton to the X-ray IMRT treatment. All of this treatment, all of these patients were treated with a curative intention. By curative intention, we means that we give uh, 50 grade and above to the tumor, and we show a survival benefit by using proton therapy because proton with proton therapy we can give a higher biological equivalent dose to the tumor at the same time uh, reduce the uh, amount of the events of uh, this radiation induced liver toxicity RILD so this is just a case a gentleman 76 years old uh, uh, actually from Malaysia from Penang uh, he, he went 7.3 7 Three centimeter tumor at this, at here, at this part of the liver, and then he went to see eleven specialist surgeon. According to him, ten of the specialists said this is not resectable. Only one surgeon from a island hospital, if I'm not wrong, said it's resectable. So, so she was so hesitate to receive the surgery because only one said it's resectable. So, she don't want to do the surgery. We came to Taiwan for second opinion, and we treated it it with a uh, 72 gray uh, in 22 fractions uh, and the uh, tumor control in field tumor control is very good uh, very recently the tumor has strength to three centimeters and there is no any viable signal on the MRI or PET scan but uh, he experienced a intrahepatic recurrence uh, one and a half half year later and uh, I judge that these three uh, recurrence can be treated with RFA so I sent it to the GI specialist to do the RFA for the three recurrence and since then there is no uh, new disease recurrence so do I still have time for head and neck cancer? okay now let me stop here thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for this very comprehensive uh, report on the therapy is the one uh, top of the town. I think for, for information, I think our badminton legend, Dato Lee Jong-wei, have the 
ENT MPC treated in uh, Changgung uh, Memorial as well. Yeah. So I think uh, we will move to the next one. But before we move to the next one, maybe just 30 seconds, half a minute, we let Prof Ho just comment on the our direction proposal. Any comment you'd like to make? Just for our own, you know, what, what, what do you see in the future for us? Yeah. Um, so I see you treated 3,800 cases. Um, so did, did it lose money or is it um, break even? I think now it's break even. Just break even. After starting to break even. Alright, so uh, you break even after how many cases? 3,000 cases? After seven years. Seven years. Oh, after seven years? Yeah, how, how, after how many cases you break even? Exactly oh, all right, all right, all right. So this comes to financial uh, calculation as well, which is very important. Yeah? They'll find that people ask you how you break even. Yeah? Nothing comes free. Yeah? All right, okay. So we'll move to the, the, the next talk by uh, Dr. Zulaika from our team from the Department of uh, Oncology on the topic of uh, the review of advances in uh, radiotherapy uh, technique. Uh, Zulaika, please. Good afternoon. Okay, so um, I think because we are running late, <laughs> a bit late of time, so I just, um, I just, uh, I would like to skip a few slides and maybe just go to the most important uh, slide for my talk for today. So, um, so this is just a sharing session on the uh, review of uh, advanced radiotherapy techniques that have been offered in our um, uh, in our unit. So. Um, this is just uh, a brief introduction on um, where is the location of our uh, oncology unit. Okay, um, so um, so we have undergo a two major renovation in order to replace our old DNEC to the advanced uh, DNEC. That so in 2014 we received um, Linac Novalis TX, and in 2017 we have received uh, a Linac Versa HD. waiting so basically um, we have started our IMRT services since 2016 and uh, at the same time we started our uh, offering SBRT and also all the stereotactic uh, radio surgery treatment the SRS and also SRT so uh, since then uh, the number of cases for our MRT cases has been increased since uh, the year 2016 and until today So this is the staff, the clinical oncologist, and also um, the three of us, the um, academic medical physicists, who involved in also uh, in the clinical. Okay, so um, just a brief um, um, a brief uh, explanation on um, our Novalis TX, where we have the exact track system that allows us to detect the intrafractional tumor motion during treatment delivery. So um, we can verify and correct the positioning of the um, tumor and also the patient up to submillimeter accuracy. So, um, and we have the second inec where uh, it is equipped with the ultrasound system. So our ultrasound system is the for real-time positioning tracking, which we use it um, together with the transperineal probe um, for the prostate MRT cases and also prostate uh, SBRT cases. So with the use... Okay. So with the use of this SBRT, uh, the, with the use of our 
ultrasound uh, clarity system, we are able to offer the SBRT for prostate uh, treatment. So uh, another uh, additional, um, additional latest system that we have in our Linac is the surface guided radiation therapy, where uh, we it allows us to um, uh, to treat our breast radiotherapy uh, patient using the deep inspiration breath hold technique. So with this, we can reduce a lot. Uh, we can reduce those uh, to the heart organ. Um, uh, quite significant in comparison to the standard 3D RT um, treatment. So, uh, looking back at the evolution of uh, radiotherapy, so um, we are right now in this area where we are offering the MRT VMAT together with the IGRT, uh, together with the IGRT for our IMRT and and also all the stereotactic uh, treatment. So, um, we are quite sure that we are. On the uh, on the correct track of uh, reduction of normal uh, tissue doses, so um, uh, since then we are offering all this kind of complex technique. So um, I'm happy to say that we are the first government center to provide the SBRT um, technique, and also we are also the uh, first government center to use the cobalt sixty source for our HDR uh, brachytherapy. So most of the brachytherapy cases is for uh, gynecological cases such as the cervix, cervical and also vaginal but we do also um, uh, offer the brachytherapy for skin, esophageal and also liver. So depending upon uh, requests from other uh, team. Uh, so this is the statistic that uh, st uh, the number of BRT cases according to techniques. So you can see that there is the trend of increasing of IMRT uh, treatment and also SBRT treatment in our centre. Um, so focusing on SBRT cases, uh, so uh, this, I'm sorry this is not percentage, so the number of SBRT cases in our centre um, um, is more on the spine and then followed uh, by the lung and also uh, the non-spine uh, bone mats. So, um, uh, we, we have done a retrospective study on uh, looking the outcome of patients that were treated from January 2016 until January 2021 with oligomets um, uh, treated with SBRT. So um, we would like to report the overall survival, the progression uh, free survival and also the local control rate, taking into account the tolerability and also factors affecting the outcomes. So. Um, uh, the highest oligomets lesion treated uh, comes from the colorectal as the primary cancer, okay, and the least uh, comes from the lung as the primary cancer. So for the rest of the um, primary malignancy, we collectively uh, analyze it as a single group, which uh, comes from the um, hair and neck, thymoma, thyroid, gynae, and upper GI. And um, at the mo at the uh, during the study period, uh, at that time there is no liver and adrenal uh, lesions uh, were treated uh, at the time of the study conducted. So uh, as a result, we found out that um, for the total of forty patients with a median follow up time of twenty nine months, the there is a ninety seven point five percent of one year overall survival, seventy nine percent of uh, one year uh, PFS with 80% uh, of local control rate for one year and overall LCR of 75%. Uh, so only two patients with the treatment related at this event and we, there is no local progression during the study period in 36 out of 48 treated lesions with no grade 2 and above uh, adverse event. So um, our results suggest uh, a promising outcome in terms of one year um, overall survival and also one year PFS. And um, this is quite comparable and also consistent with uh, other published data. But the most importantly that uh, we know that this SBRT technique was tolerable in these patients. So again, coming back to this um, picture, um, we would like to remind ourselves of the evolution of the radiotherapy. So we know that we are currently in the IMRT and VMAT um, era. And Unfortunately, we don't have this particular uh, therapy in our center, but we move towards um, focusing on the adaptive uh, radiotherapy, the art. Okay, so that this is a way to move forward um, for um, our center. So um, a brief introduction on the adaptive radiotherapy. So what is art? 
So art is a radiation therapy process where the treatment is in adapted to account for um, anatomical changes. So we know that throughout the course of radiotherapy treatment, okay, that the the tumor and also the normal tissue will be responded uh, to the dose, to the delivery dose. So this will cause the organs in the body to change in size and also shape over the uh, treatment time. So by doing daily art adaptive radiotherapy, um, we can lower the organ at risk exposure while at the same time maintaining the dose to the planning target volume. So um, the arts can be divided into two categories, the online and also offline art, where, okay, so if, so if you look, if you look at these images, okay, so uh, for the online art, on the day of the treatment itself, okay, before we proceed with uh, treatment delivery, usually the radiographer will, will acquire a set of CBCT images. So these CBCT images will be used to verify the positioning of the patient and also the and also the location of the tumor. If let's say on that day itself the tumor and also the nearby organ at risk has changed, um, as, uh, there is a significant change in size and shape. So on the spot, we are going to um, assess and replan the treatment, and also we are going to treat. The patient um, using the new plan uh, in uh, uh, instead of using the original plan, but for offline, usually um, the daily treatment will be um, will be using the the original plan. But at the same time, we are going to assess the plan uh, according to these uh, changes uh, in the anatomy. So um, these are example of the. Uh, of the uh, anatomical changes um, taking uh, happens in the tumor, okay, of uh, NPC and also paratic patient. So you can see that there is a significant difference from the fr uh, in the uh, from the first uh, from the first uh, day of the treatment, uh, as shown by the image A and D, and throughout the treatment, maybe during the fraction 12 or 13, uh, the tumor has responded well to the treatment. So we are going to uh, fuse and adapt the new images onto the original images. So, you, you're, so what we have here in picture C and F is the deformable image registration. So with the use of this deformable image registration, you can appreciate the significant difference in terms of dose to the certain uh, area. So this is what we call as response art. Um, in another thing of uh, art, okay, we also can evaluate the um, organ changes which may affecting the dose to the organ areas. So you can see that on the day of the first treatment, the rectum is quite nice, but throughout the treatment um, fraction, maybe around fraction 10 or 12, the rectum has changed in size and shape. So how does this affecting our uh, treatment and also dose? So you can see that um, the 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 treated dose is actually um, much is actually quite different with the planned dose. So this is what we call as anatomy art. So um, in order to implement art in in the department, so art requires four underlying key technologies. So we should have um, uh, imaging. The imaging which can be performed either with the use of CBCT or MRI and also we need to have the assessment key, a process by which imaging is used to decide whether to adapt the plan or not, Okay, which um, uh, the de deformable image registration system is an important system for, for this assessment. And then the third one is the replanning which includes the auto-contouring or auto-delineation of the target volume and also the um, organ areas and also uh, auto-planning system. And the most important thing is quality assurance because we know that art is a highly complex process which the quality assurance is quite critical to ensure safe delivery of art. So of all this, in our center, we do have the CBCT, DIR, auto-control and auto-planning. So that is why we move towards um, the um, initiative to, to introduce art in our department. So we managed to secure a grant um, to, um, to start this art project, 
which were which um, leads by one of our um, medical physicists, academic academician, and also um, we work uh, in close cooperation with another two uh, group uh, comes from the faculty of uh, science from the physics department uh, in order to use the the suitable detector for the skin dose measurement, which we focus. The, the art uh, to be uh, implemented for our NPC uh, cases and also we have uh, another medical physicist from the biomedical imaging department um, to help us in uh, the AI assisted um, matter. So um, at the moment we are introducing uh, the, auto the automation of the uh, delineation in our system uh, in our department and also um, the automatic treatment planning system. So uh, again, uh, by looking at this, we now know that we are on the correct uh, track and we hope that although we don't have the particle therapy, okay, we can offer um, uh, improvement, some improvement in our um, radiotherapy services. Okay, with that, I thank you. Thanks a lot, Sulaika. Yeah, thanks. Huh? I think uh, in the future, I think you will start to handle uh, proton therapy very soon already. Once Rocco <laughs> bought the machine, uh, very soon. <laughs> One day, you will get that, yeah. So I think we will change tone now, yeah, to the, uh, now all oncology, yeah. Now we will move to uh, uh, plastic surgery, yeah. We will learn a bit about plastic surgery, uh, cleverly, cleft handed uh, repair. So we'll hand the session to uh, Prof. Yeah. yeah, so I think uh, we move on. Uh, we will discuss about uh, plastic surgery. So I'd like to introduce our professor, Professor uh, Fu Chen Wei. Uh, I think if I want to uh, uh, talk about our Professor Wei, probably it'll take an hour to introduce him. So uh, I am uh, apologize to uh, Professor Wei. I can just uh, shortly uh, introduce him. Uh, he's uh, just two living legend of uh, our uh, modern uh, plastic surgery. Uh, because uh, he's a real uh, surgeon that contributes a lot in uh, plastic surgery. Maybe uh, throughout his talk, he can introduce himself and uh, Port Wave uh, have won a lot of uh, awards and he also now the uh, member of uh, Acad uh, Academia Seneca, the highest uh, uh, prestigious um, uh, science uh, member council in, in Taiwan. So uh, I think maybe I will let uh, Professor Wei uh, talk about his, uh, himself and, uh, and share his topic. So let's uh, give a warm welcome to uh, Professor Wei. And thank you for joining us online. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, First of all, I'd like to thank uh, UM for the warm welcome of our team. And i also like to uh, have my apology that I was not able to join you in the last the moment because my uh, the work here is of my wife. I'd like to, uh, in this presentation, I'd like to uh, share with you how we built an international center for microsurgical service, and not only for that, but also for education and research at our centers. Next, please. Next, please. Someone move the slide for me. Thank you very much. Someone is going to move the slide for me, right? Thank you very much. Okay, and in this talk, I'd like to share with you the history and current status and of uh, Chang'an as well as the Department of Plastic Surgery and the Division of Microscopic Microsurgery and follow my personal microsurgical career. And I'm not also going to introduce you some of the outstanding staff at our department and their major contribution. And in the last part, I'd like to introduce to you what are the training opportunities for domestic and international microsurgeon at our department. Next, please. Chang'an was uh, 
found it in 1977, and I was lucky that I was able to join from its beginning as a children in general surgery. Next, please. At present time, this uh, Chang'an in Lingko become a conglomerate. And in the hospital, uh, the island wide, we have a total of 10 hospitals and with more than 11,000 beds. This is not very updated, but we have more than uh, one and 11,000 beds around the island. Next, please. The founder of our department is Dr. Nordoff. Sam Nordoff from the United States, and he arrived in Taiwan in 1985, in 1959, and left after 40 years. Next, please. He sent me to Toronto, where I spent almost two years to learn the reconstructive micro surgery at the very beginning of this uh, new practice. Next, please. At present time, uh, it's belong to the Department of Plastic Surgery, and it's a division. In this division, uh, those people that work in mainly for uh, microsurgery uh, can be divided into head and neck, and upper and lower extremity, breast and lymph edema, as well as peripheral nerve and the brachial plexus. We have a total of full-time 19 staff, all in uh, the constructive microsurgery. Of course, all the residents rotate through our division, and at the same time, we also have about eight to ten uh, international fellows a year. Next, please. What make our, our unit unique is that we have our own microsurgical intensive care unit. It was established in 1988, and even at this time, still have 20 beds. It serves us uh, for patient service but also for teaching and education, as well as for correction of the research material. Next, please. We have also our own rehabilitation center, and which help us to uh, enhance the surgical result. At the present time, we have us nine physical therapists and four occupational therapists. Next, please. Through the year, we have performed more than 5,000 cases of implantations. Next, please. And we also have close to 3,000 cases of brachial plexus reconstructions. Next. For the free tissue transfer, we have more than 26,000. And if we break down into upper and lower extremity, breast, lymph edema, and uh, a head and neck, you can see the break represent the uh, cancer in head and neck regions. Next, please. Although we have uh, exposed to almost 50 kind of free tissue transfer, but in the recent 20 years, we try to set down, settle down, and those are the top 10 free tissue transfers. In terms of the soft tissue, we like to use anterior to side for the bone, we like to use fibula. Next, please. The next section I'm going to share with you my professional, personal professional career. Although I start the reconstructive microsurgery in my department, I have exposed to almost all kinds of microsurgical reconstruction. But I like to say I spend most of my time in three lines of reconstruction. The first one, is toe to hand transfer. The second one is perforated flap for soft tissue and coverage reconstruction. And the third one is fibula osteoceptor for long bone or for jaw reconstruction. Next. Here are several examples represent my work. The first one is so called trim gray toe, which means that while we transfer the gray toe for some reconstruction, we can trim it to make it small and then can be more similar to the uh, normal thumb. And this is the, uh, I mean the case that not only showing the functional result, but cosmetically very acceptable. <coughs> Next please. I also popularized 
the so-called partial toe transplantation. This is particularly useful for the distal finger reconstruction. It's a light tissue reconstruction, but however, the functional result is very pleasing and it's very rewarding to both the patient and the surgeons. Here you can see the very finger tip amputation and we use the very distal part of the toe for reconstruction and patient gain the functional result in three months time. Next. The next one is more complicated, the so-called and the couple hand. It can be type one or type two. Type one means that the thumb still maintain its functional length, but the fingers were amputated proximal to its functional length. In this kind of patient, we advocate transfer a combined second and third toe unit and then to reconstruct two adjustable fingers at one time. And here you can see the functional result and appearance. Next, please. The type two metacarpal hand means that all the five digits were amputated proximal to its functional level. And in this kind of patient, depend on the remaining function of thinner muscle, you can perform the reconstruction either in one stage or in two stages. Like in the left side, it's a case metacarpal and type two. We were able to reconstruct them in one stage by transferring a trim gray top for the thumb and a combined second circle from the opposite leg for the fingers and see the good result. And on your right side, you see it's a type 2C, means that the thinner muscle function is not good. So in this patient, although we're still able to reconstruct a so-called opposable thumb, but we like to stage them. And we like to do finger reconstruction with the combined second and third first and followed by the sum reconstruction. Here showing the good result. Next please. Here are the statistics of our total hand transfer up to last December. We have performed more than 23 hundreds of failures of total hand transfer. Of course, the second total is the number one. But here you can see also we have more than 200 cases of great toe and the combined second and third toe. This means that we feel comfortable about the donor side mobility because of the accumulation of the experience. We're able to minimize the donor side mobility. Next, please. In the next section, I'd like to introduce to you the so called perforated flap. The perforated flap means that the vessels supply the skin through the muscle, through the muscle. And when you dissect this as a perforated flap, you do intramuscular dissection so that you don't need to include the muscle. Because of this practice, it's greatly expanded the bone side of a uh, uh, soft tissue flap in the whole body. And we make some major contribution to its development. Next, please. Use anterior lateral side as a example. Depending on the recipient side requirement, we're able to elevate flap on purely skin portion, the so-called suprafascial dissection. We also can include the fascia and load the fascia into the tendon structures so that we're able to reconstruct the concomitant uh, defect in the tendons. When we need the larger volume, you can include the muscle the standard so-called myocutaneous flap. And if you dissect more proximally of the pedicle, you even can include the bone for the, the composite defect construction. Next, please. With this bulk of whole strap, we're able to reconstruct many, many oncology and traumatic and trauma defect, such as in this patient, a hemigrosectomy involved the flow of the mouse was reconstructed with an anterior toe flap, and also we used the redundant part of the anterior toe flap for reconstruction of the neck, which underwent the radical neck dissection. So this provide the tissue for obliteration of the dead space, and also for the soft tissue uh, volume replacement. Therefore, it's taking of both the functional and aesthetic results and the donor side is very acceptable. Next, please. 
And here is the good example of using this drug for compound defect. The patient had Achilles tendon defect for six centimeter and with the simultaneous defect coverage. So therefore, we use the fascia tetanus drug. The fascia is slowly into a core-like structure to replace the missing Achilles tendon and the skin for the coverage construction. And without further revision, you see the patient gain very good functional results. Next, please. And this become a workhorse drug, as you can see in this breakdown diagram. So far, we have almost 9,100 cases of arteriotocyte, and they are mainly used for head and neck. Of course, many of them were also used for the extremity reconstructions. Next, please. Because of the surgical steel gain from dissection, intramuscular dissection, we are able to come up with the freestyle free flap. For example, in this patient, there's a soft tissue defect in the dorsum of the hand, and we have identified dobra sum in the leg, and where the anatomy we were not familiar with in the past. And we make an incision, and then to identify the vessels. Of course, this uh, should be done by Dr. Sun before we make this uh, incision. And then from there, you see a very sizable uh, vascular pedicle. It depends on this pedicle, and it depends on it, it, the cost in the uh, uh, septum. The dissection will be easier. But however, if the vessels it, it travels inside the muscle, we're able to do intramuscular dissection. And here with this, then you're able to elevate a small free flap from an, a non-area anatomy uh, anatomy to you. And this next, for the same, uh, I mean, um, uh, approach, here there's a anterior tibia defect, and then we try to find the top sun in the adjacent area. And based on that, then we are elevate a pedicle flap. And this flap was not known to us in the past. So this is the so-called uh, freeze start. Next, please. So we like to say that we're able to change the conventional free flap or pedicle flap into a perforative flap or perforated pedicle flap. And at this time, it's a free start, a free flap. So we are no more bothered by lack of free flap on the side. Next, please. And last of my um, contribution, the third one is the vascular uh, fibula. Although it's most commonly used the donor side for vascular bone since 1970, it has good bone length and a good bone clarity with a pedicle, good pedicle. But however, the skin pedal on the lateral aspect of the fibula still remain unknown for its variability until in 1980s. Next, please. This is a study I performed in 1983. I was able to prove that the vascular branch from the peroneal artery can supply adequate skin, adequate circulation to the skin on the lateral aspect of the leg along the posterior line of the fibula. With this, then we are able to elevate the fibula together with a, a piece of skin for simultaneous compound defect reconstruction. Next, please. Such as in this uh, patient, the patient had post uh, osteosarcoma and received the resection from the oncologist. And the defect consists of a bone in the humerus as well as the soft tissue coverage. So in this patient, we use the fibula osteoceptopathy flap for one stage reconstruction. Next, please. Next, please. No, yes. And for the lower trinity, this patient presents to us with a compound defect in the uh, femoral. So we use the same approach 
we have a fibula with the a skin flap from the lateral aspect of the leg to reconstruct the post bone and soft tissue defect at the same time. Next, please. And the fibula osteoceptor which stands from even expanded to the reconstruction uh, in the head and neck region, such as in this patient, a, a segmental medicine was performed. A fibula was used for reconstruction. At the same time, we also uh, implant the osteoceptor which in teeth and patient get disease free, but also the function back after total uh, enter rehabilitation. Next, please. The same kind of uh, approach, same kind of application to the upper jaw. Here is a patient present to us with upper jaw uh, defect, and we use fibula for reconstruction of the bone and also the intraoral lining. And this then was complete by dental rehabilitation. Next, please. So far, we have performed almost 3,000 cases of uh, fibula, osteoceptor construct to long bone and the jaws. Next, please. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce several very outstanding and talented colleagues from our service. The first one is Hong Ji Chen, who is famous for his talent, and uh, here is an example that he not only provide the esophageal reconstruction with either skin flap or power, but he also at the same time can help the patient to create the so-called voice tube. And so that patient not only can have alimentary continuity, but also able to speech. Next, please. And David Zhang is another very talented surgeon, and he devoted his lifetime for brachial plexus and functioning muscle. So he has been recognized by many uh, societies and was the formal president of the World Society of Reconstructive Medical Surgery. Among his contribution, he had done a wonderful job in brachial plexus uh, reconstruction as the upper low one and also the functioning muscle uh, reconstruction for the facial palsy, as you see in the lower part of this patient. Next, please. Shen Feng Zhen is the one helped me to realize the so-called perforator flap, freestyle free flap. And here are several examples that he made this uh, coverage reconstruction in a much easier way and with a good functional result. Next, please. And Qi Hong Lin, I'd like to say uh, he is the most prominent trauma microsurgeon. He is showing in the upper one, showing the very complicated bilateral tibia defect, and he used the brief for reconstruction of both of them. And recently, he also contributed to the cornea neurotization and get some promising results. Next, please. Ming Hui Zhen is one of the pioneers in uh, vascular lymph node uh, transfer and also very uh, well known for his skill in breast reconstruction. Here you can see the good result of his breast reconstruction and also the lymph edema. He was the Opina uh, lectures. Next, please. Johnson is a younger surgeon but the, he is a good at the lymphatic venous anastomosis. And here you can see two cases that this severe uh, uh, inforia patient, and a life threatening uh, issue to the patient, he was able to treat them very successfully. And so far he has done so many cases and won the international recognition. Next please. Yo Denin currently is the chairman of the, our surgical department, and he is famous for the so-called vascular joint transfer. So instead of using the artificial joint for joint replacement, he was able to use the vascular joint from the toe to reconstruct the destroyed, uh, the disrupted 
John in the fingers and with good result. Next, please. And also, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lee. He's the one helping the liver transplantation surgeon for the microastomosis to the artery vein as well as to the media tree so that we have not only a higher success rate in the living donor liver transplantation, but also very minimal a leakage of media tree. This is because of the micro, micro surgical contribution. Next, please. This is repeat, can you? Next, please. And we also use the robotic to assist the DIEP. And at the same time, we provide mineralization when we do the breast reconstruction. This is mainly done by our lady, a plastic surgeon, JJ Fang. Next, please. The other one, next, please. The other outstanding person is uh, Tommy Chang, who uh, hosts the International Micro Surgical Club and contribute greatly uh, in the past three years for the continuing education of uh, reconstructive micro surgical education. His another major contribution is that he is able to solve the problem of um, the so called hypercompensatory hyperhidrosis. And as you can see in the center of the pictures, the patient was bothered very much of the sympathectomy for the hypohydrosis. And, and then he used the robotic surgery and nerve graft concept to restore the, div the divided sympathetic nerve and help the patient to solve the problem. Next, please. In the division of reconstructive microsurgery, we also have an active research lab and mainly devoted to the VCA research. We use different kind of animal uh, to create the auto transplantation and through the cell therapy and we are able to uh, identify the mechanism of either success or failure. And we have three uh, research, uh, I mean, a uh, research research person in our in our laboratory. They all are finished their training in PhD in the United States. Next please. With uh, many years preparation and finally we uh, successfully achieved several hand transplantation. So far we have performed a total of six hand transplantation in five patients with good result. Next, please. So we not only provide good service, but we also educate the next generation reconstructive microsurgeons. Here is a tree that are coming from this microsurgical intensive care unit, the microsurgical service, and we not only train them so that they can serve the patient with good quality surgery, but they are also academically very active. Here you can see we have so far 12 professors and seven associate professors from, from this tree. Next, please. We also provide opportunity for the international visitors and fellows. So far, we have performed, so far, we have trained, trained uh, more than 170 uh, I mean fellows. They spend time uh, longer than one year with us. And for the short-term visitors, we have 2,400 patients and 400 uh, surgeons from more than 70, from 87 countries. Next, please. Next, please. And from 90, from 2014, 15, we also um, established a master uh, degree of the constructive microsurgery in our universities. So when the when the federal are accepted, they also register to the university. So by the time they successfully fulfill their, uh, their duties and they prove to be eligible for graduation, they not only uh, given 
the certificate of a uh, fellowship, but when they are able to publish uh, papers in SCI, in SCI journals, we also give them the master degree. Next, please. And here is the uh, diploma they will be able to uh, to get when they are able to uh, successfully fulfill their uh, obligation and the ability, achieve the ability for fellowship and also for the publication. So with this, next please. So with this, I like to say that our International Microsurgical Center is a comprehensive one. It's not only provide the service for trauma, cancer, congenital developmental, and also for the different, for the difficult wound care, but also it serves as a major hub for education and training. Of course, from the, ex the uh, our experience, we also found that it can be claimed as a research center. But with this, I'd like to conclude my presentation and I'd like to uh, once again thank UM for hosting us and allow us to have this opportunity uh, to share our experience and hopefully we're able to establish uh, the continuous, uh, continuous relationship in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I hope uh, uh, Professor Wei has impressed you. I think he's really the world-renowned surgeon, and not only that, he's a very influential and uh, uh, innovative uh, plastic surgeon, and, and also a very good mentor, you can see that. I think we all learn from him and appreciate his uh, contribution. Maybe, maybe uh, is there any, any question for our Professor Wei? Uh, I really appreciate that he stayed with us until now. Any any question or you want to? Uh, if not, uh, yeah, we can we can continue like uh, Professor Wei mentioned. Uh, we can continue uh, to discuss and collaborate in the future. So uh, because of the time strain, but uh, we still have one more uh, important topic. Uh, I, will, I would like to introduce our last uh, 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 lecturer here, uh, Professor Lo. Uh, Professor Lo is also from the plastic surgery department and he contributed a lot in the clip palette uh, 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 surgery and uh, he is a very uh, uh, devoted surgeon and he involved a lot of uh, charity work so maybe uh, I would like him to uh, tell you his story and, 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 and to impress you. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> Uh, thank you. I think I will take uh, 20 minutes to uh, briefly introduce you uh, uh, what uh, we have done uh, in the past 40 years in terms of the, uh, developing the, the correct care in, in Taiwan. Uh, I have no conflict of interest. Uh, this is what one example that uh, this patient uh, follow up from the, from the newborn until uh, she uh, uh, 20 years of age, uh, she at the when uh, six times of surgery from deep repair, power repair, and uh, uh, follow for veropharyngeal insufficiency, and then a bone graft, uh, also Nazi surgery, and final uh, lip nose revision, and then she uh, become a normal and beautiful lady. And this is another case uh, who only uh, received four times of surgery. Uh, the first time lip and palate, second time and uh, uh, rhinoplasty at the preschool age. And uh, finally, uh, also don't treatment. And she uh, was happy uh, with the result. Uh, as you can see here, this is our previous protocol. Now we have a much better uh, protocol in terms of timing and technique and which uh, could significantly reduce the uh, uh, the the burden of care uh, because every time we could uh, achieve the excellence uh, in the surgical uh, outcome. So this is uh, Dr. Nodov, my mentor uh, in the credit and pilot surgery. Uh, he came to Taiwan uh, 
1959 and uh, set up the, the crab surgery team as really a, a multidisciplinary and very uh, famous team uh, in the world. So we have a lot of uh, so-called uh, uh, the fellow uh, visitor from uh, all over the world. And this is our current protocol and we uh, perform uh, lip repair three months of age and, and then uh, nine months of age we uh, we perform pilot repair and then uh, in the mixed dentition nine years of age uh, we we do uh, available graft and then uh, then they become skeletally mature we do the final assessment and set up this uh, the final treatment plan that could include uh, the uh, orthodontic treatment, uh, orthodontic surgery, uh, as well as final uh, lip and nose uh, uh, revision. So this finished the whole course of the uh, training. So this is our current current protocol. And you can see here, this is actually a published data comparing uh, what we have, uh, what we did uh, in 1994 and then what we are now doing uh, in 2023, uh, you can see the, the very different uh, treatment timing as well as method. And you can see that uh, in the previous uh, treatment, uh, it, uh, even we uh, did very uh, careful surgery, still a significant number of cases uh, that would require a secondary uh, intermediate rhinoplasty in the preschool age because the nose uh, just doesn't look uh, perfect. And uh, also the pilot repair the same. Uh, we used to have very high percentage of varipharyngeal insufficiency, 36% that would require uh, further surgical intervention. And right now we have less than 5% that require uh, additional operation. So this is also a very uh, good uh, advancement. And then the alveolar bone graft, uh, we, we now use the Trifen uh, burr hole technique and this uh, significantly uh, improve uh, the success rate and also to reduce the donor side pain in the iliac spine. So our uh, current concept actually is to move toward the best uh, surgical outcome and then uh, this could uh, significantly reduce the burden of care especially uh, when patients uh, could not you know uh, available to have uh, you know very continuous multiple treatment so uh, to improve the, the result actually uh, could reduce uh, the burden of care and this uh, you can see here the really require a team uh, not only the surgeon, but also uh, orthodontist, uh, speech, uh, psychosocial, and even the family support group. This is uh, very uh, quite helpful that uh, the newborn baby, uh, the mother feel uh, anxiety, and then uh, we could have a volunteer to, to come to uh, tell them the experience, so that could uh, quite uh, you know, significantly reduce the, uh, the anxiety. And uh, very important is the long-term care that uh, we, our, our uh, because in Taiwan, is, uh, uh, transportation is easy, uh, small area, so we could have uh, continued follow-up up to adulthood. And uh, this is a lip repair, again, the uh, three uh, three months old. This is a very traditional rotation advancement, and uh, uh, just no fancy, uh, no, uh, you know, uh, not difficult, no measurement, just uh, do the skin design, and uh, we focus on dissecting the muscle. Uh, if you do the muscle like this, uh, you know, extensive muscle dissection, uh, muscle Z plus Z, uh, and we believe the skin should follow the muscle. Okay, not muscle following the skin, so that I, I, I believe that you don't really need to uh, do the skin measurement. And, uh, and then uh, currently we are routinely do uh, Tajima type of uh, semi-open rhinoplasty and this really uh, is very uh, successful and, and have very nice result. Uh, this is uh, a case that we previously uh, did uh, 
without Tajima, you can see that uh, only after the operation, the nose already look good. But then uh, follow up five years, 20 years, you can see significant nasal tip deformity. The no little college separated. So this shows that the importance of uh, doing uh, Tajima in the primary rhinoplasty. This kind of nose actually need uh, definitely need uh, secondary rhinoplasty. And this is another case that uh, even though you look a uh, perfect result, but still do not hesitate to do uh, the Tajima rhinoplasty. This case did not, so you can see nine years of age, uh, the nose already show uh, tip deformity. This is my first uh, case of doing the Tajima semi-open rhinoplasty, year 2000. Uh, you can see uh, after uh, 17 years later, the uh, nasal tip still remain well defined. Okay, this is uh, also the nostril is symmetric, so there uh, absolutely no uh, no need of secondary rhinoplasty uh, for her uh, nasal tip. So this is my second case, uh, again the same. Uh, perform uh, op operation three months later, and then follow up 18 years later. The nasal tip remains good with a uh, symmetric nostril. So this is again a nice uh, result. Pilot repair the same. Uh, we uh, this is uh, just uh, uh, a regular uh, procedure: long length back, uh, wadial kilna, and uh, two flat. Uh, right now we are doing this uh, furrow type of double opposing Z. I think this has gradually become popular and I think this uh, uh, will be even more popular in the future. But our uh, modification is to do a small uh, double opposing Z, not a regular Z. Because if you do a regular Z, you have a, a much bigger tension. You do this only 5 millimeters smaller Z you actually could uh, dissect the muscle uh, more uh, effectively without lengthening the soft palate too much. But the muscle reconstruction uh, has been uh, complete. So, And also, this is our previous technique of using the surgery cell to cover the lower surface. But right now, we are using this uh, buccal fat pad. I think the fat uh, has become a very popular tool and material. Uh, in our practice in plastic surgery. We, we use fat everywhere, in palate, in nose, in face, in breast, everywhere. Uh, I think the fat is uh, uh, a very uh, useful material for the reconstruction. You can see here, with or without uh, buccal fat, you can easily uh, you know, uh, tell the difference. Uh, the dental arch uh, become much normal and, and, and wider uh, and you know, uh, with the uh, beautiful dentition, uh, if you use the buccal fat, available graph the same. Uh, we we now have been using the scapa fascia to protect the deep area, so you don't have to harvest uh, too much uh, bone graft. Uh, more bone graft, more deformity. So and also with this uh, uh, scapa fascia. I think the uh, the infection rate is much less, so uh, success uh, success rate is higher. And this is also that I mentioned the bird hole uh, technique with the trifat, uh, just a small uh, fine uh, six millimeter uh, uh, bird hole that you can easily harvest uh, one to two strip of the cancerous bone graft. So uh, this. Uh, uh, the donor side, you can see only one centimeter of uh, scar here in the iliac spine. Uh, and patient's pain, uh, patient's uh, pain experience maybe only uh, three to five days. So, so this is a very nice. And we compare the uh, traditional uh, treptal technique or uh, uh, split technique. And with the burho technique, I think the pain is much less, the scar is much shorter. So recovery time is uh, is uh, faster uh, using this technique, and also if you use uh, uh, scapa fascia, you only have to harvest one cc of uh, cancer spawn. If you use uh, uh, for the bilateral, you only need a uh, two cc. Uh, previously, we harvest much more uh, cancer uh, cancer spawn uh, for the for the available bone graft, and this is one example that uh, after. 
uh, cancerous bone graft and then also don't treatment you had a uh, very beautiful uh, dentition occlusion as well and and then uh, at the final assessment uh, when uh, the patient uh, reach maturity uh, we do uh, a, a team evaluation and to see uh, whether we do uh, also Nazi surgery or, and then secondary uh, lip revision and uh, we now routinely use uh, crab or Nazi surgery using the three-dimensional uh, simulation and uh, uh, very uh, helpful this is just one example that uh, mature patient after also Nazi surgery and after lip and nose uh, revision so this is a, a team care, a uh, long-term follow-up, and uh, certainly we have a, we need to have a good document documentation. So very briefly introduce uh, what we have done, what we are doing in uh, in terms of the crab care. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, uh, Professor Lo, for your sharing. Uh, I think that will conclude the whole. Uh, seminar section. I know that uh, uh, everyone is uh, eager to go home, and especially in this uh, fasting month. Uh, thank you for staying with us. But I don't.